welcome to uh, this Christmas special edition of uh, the Young Professionals Network. Um, it's great to see so many people here tonight. Um, it's, I think it's a really great panel we have and it's also uh, really nice to see some new people. Um, I'd like to thank Nancy, our uh, outgoing uh, colleague who helped a lot with organising this. So thank you Nancy. Um, there was 20 people signed up before she got involved so it was a much better event. Um, I, I guess most of you noticed, uh, maybe conspicuously, that uh, Lisa Chambers uh, wasn't able to make it today. She she just let us know recent, uh, earlier today that uh, she fell sick with an illness. I don't know what else do you fall sick with? She fell sick <laughs> and um, she wasn't able to make it. But we are very lucky to um, have the opportunity to now invite Hannah DC uh, onto the panel. Hannah is our Director of Communications here at the IIEA. Uh, but also has a huge amount of experience um, and knowledge in both Irish and European politics, um, having worked in the European Parliament for the Party of European Socialists for five years, um, and she's also um, Deputy Chair of uh, Labour Women here in Ireland, so has a great experience and can bring a lot to the table regarding that. Um, then beside her on the left is Ben Tonra, who is a Professor of International Relations at UCD, um, one of Ireland's kind of foremost thinkers uh, in uh, foreign policy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure! Uh, a leading thinker, a leading scholar, and um, uh, has held other prestigious uh, roles in his life, most importantly, uh, director of research at the IIA here. Um, and then finally, uh, but certainly not least, is Shona Murray. Um, who uh, is with us today despite undergoing emergency dental surgery only three hours ago. So thank you very much, Shona. Um, some people are hardy and hardy. Uh, and Shona is, is a, one of Ireland's leading journalists. She spent a lot of time um, in news talk and then was a correspondent for the um, Irish Independent, uh, as also did freelance work for Time, but now is um, the Brussels correspondent for Euronews, which It'd be interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on maybe how that has changed, and how your perspective has changed going to a, a big kind of Europe-wide news agency. So we're really excited to have Shona here. And the format of tonight is that I'm going to ask each of uh, the speakers just to talk for maybe about five minutes to, you know, maybe lay a path of what they thought were some of the significant events, both domestic uh, but also international, uh, of the last year. And then we will open it up for discussion with the panellists, and I, I'd invite you all to get involved, uh, ask questions, maybe if you think that they missed something that you thought was an important part of this year, we'd love to, love to hear your thoughts about it as well. This is a very open discussion, um, and we want to get a good uh, perspective of what you think uh, was the most important uh, events of 2018. Um, and then after the event, after the talk, or after the panel discussion, uh, we'll have a few more drinks there. I know we ran out of Prosecco, but there actually is more Prosecco downstairs, <laughs> so there will be more Prosecco. Uh, we just had to keep it so that you'll stay. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to uh, open the discussion with Shona. Yeah. yeah and, and so, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so, I, I was trying to, you know, I mean, you can take your pick of the amount of things that have happened this year that are worth discussing. But I think sometimes that, um, it's always nice to be able to, I suppose, draw some sort of comparison or draw Ireland into some of it. Yeah. And you can with most things in the EU, although in Ireland, I think very problematically, we see um, Brexit and the EU in isolation. We very much have an island mentality when it comes to Europe. But a few things, anyway. Let's, well, first of all, of course, is Brexit. is one of the most that's obvious that Ireland has a relationship with Brexit. But I think one of the things that I've just really has hit home over the past few weeks covering since the publication of the withdrawal agreement and the last the conversations of the past few days in the House of Commons was just that, you know, after Brexit and when, you know, obviously we, within the UK we know that they had um, a different relationship with Europe than maybe the rest of the other member states. It was always a sort of a, you know, confrontational relationship. And instead of, um, you know, MPs and the public in the UK becoming more aware about what the EU is about and maybe what they might lose when they, just, when they decide to pull out, I, I've, just, I've felt that in actual fact they've become even more strengthened in their opposition to the Europe, to European Union membership. Specifically when you look at the discussion about the backstop and the, la the language around it. And, you know, when you look at the debate in, in, in the House of Commons, it's constantly about the EU trying to trap the UK in this UK-wide customs union, instead of protecting the Good Friday Agreement, which they're obliged to do. That never comes into the conversation. 
and never is acknowledged that it was the UK that demanded this customs union was UK wide as well at the last minute because all the other member states had decided that this was going to be part of the future relationship and that Northern Ireland would specifically be involved in the backstop because you know you couldn't afford to have the UK in the customs union because then they get access to the single market through the back door. But so no recognition of any of the concessions made by the EU in spite of the fact that for the past two years you think that people would have been a little bit more informed about what EU membership is about. So, I mean, there are so many things to talk about Brexit, but that one I find astonishing, that in actual fact, a lot of the discussion has made me even more shocked at how little is known about European Union membership and, and what the EU is about. And then second of all, I think, uh, and it's Orban is uh, just, it's quite shocking, you know, to see what's happening. And, and, and Ireland falls into place here because Fine Gael uh, is in the EPP. And I remember um, in 2013, I think it was when we had the presidency of the European Union, um, Enda Kenny was pre had, had this role. And I, as, a, as a journalist, I remember asking him, because Orban had really started going hard on his uh, anti-democracy um, um, policies. He was making sure that principals at the time had to be members of Fidesz, uh, principals in local schools. It was serious, you know, we know what, what happened with the judiciary. And um, this, the Taoiseach's response at the time to me was just one of indignance, like, why are you even asking? Orban's our friend in the EPP. And then, and I'm not trying to pinpoint or finger Enda Kenny here, by the way, it's just because then he gave a wonderful speech in the Shelburne a few months ago uh, when he received the award for being European of the Year and talked about the, you know, the concerns he has with populism and these forces within the European Union. But they've had a chance all along to manage Orban. And now we're at this point where you know, the, one of the most important universities. A university is being kicked out of a country, the, a, a member state. And you have now a slave laws, you know, which they're dubbed slave laws. I know that's an exaggeration, of course, but the idea that you would force people to do 400 hours of, of extra overtime and only get paid three, three years later is incredible. And at the same time, we're trying to say to the UK, you know, stay in the EU, because why? Because of these wonderful working directives. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, we, and we're telling, and then we slag Jeremy Corbyn because he's Eurosceptic because he sees the EU as a neoliberal conspiracy. And then you're going, no, you're wrong, Corbyn. Um, actually, you're right, because uh, in actual fact, we're, al we're allowing this happening, happen. And uh, the EPP, one of the most important, obviously one of the most influential uh, group has done nothing to censure Orban, except for, I suppose, the Article 7, um, the sanctions, but very little has come with that. You don't hear much condemnation. And in fact, unfortunately, and I know in fairness to uh, the Irish government, it hasn't gone down this route when it comes to immigration, because we probably haven't had to, because we don't have um, that discussion in this country, because we're so far removed from the uh, immigration um, discussion, not because any other reason. Not because we're we're you know we're so forgiving or, or anything like that. Let's be, let's face it, but um, the fact that you know people like Sebastian Kurz is uh, you know is uh, in a similar vein in Austria, and nothing and they, but these all of these leaders call themselves true Europeans in the sense that we're all true Europeans and support the European project, but at the end of the day they're allowing it uh, be destroyed from within. And then the third other subject is. Um, the, well, obviously the Légion des Gens, which we saw of the few, last few weeks in France, which is a domestic matter, uh, of course, but I don't think that Ireland can be immune to it. And I, and I, and I, when you look at, and I'm not talking about that incident in Roscommon necessarily, because that's uh, like uh, quite complicated, but there are so many instances in Ireland where, for example, banks are allowing, you know, with, with vulture funds and people being mistreated by banks and the inequality that's actually fermenting more and more in Ireland, I just think that we need to be really concerned about that sort of backlash as well. And then just finally, just from an international uh, level, um, we haven't dealt with the threat from Vladimir Putin, Putin, who today, by the way, told Theresa, advised Theresa May that she should deliver on the referendum of, the, of Brexit, which is just incredible. Because and uh, why? Because it's democratic will of the people, which it just starts. <laughs> um, but yet yeah, the European Union is struggling so much, and um, we haven't be, uh, been able to deal with the Iran sanctions, extraterritorial sanctions, uh, by the United States, our supposed partner, and we haven't been able to protect industry in the EU yet. And the only solution we hear from EU leaders <coughs> is we need to get PESCO up and running, and we need to make sure we have a European army. And so that, that really, those, those, I know that's all very negative. <laughs>
I'm just going to say there, there is a concern for me, and I don't think Ireland is a small player in it. Yeah, very interesting. But one, I guess one issue is, um, or one thing people always say, I agree with you about the migration idea why Ireland is not necessarily different, in, like inherently, but it has different circumstances. But when it comes to maybe populism and these reactionary forces, a lot of people point out to the fact that we actually have arguably a more active democracy than mm -hmm. a lot of other countries, uh, both in our through our voting system that has more uh, so many a lot more proportionality, but also yeah the referendums. And this year has been obviously a very significant one. We had a huge important referendum to repeal blasphemy, and then we had the other one. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Hannah, I wonder maybe if you could touch on that, like domestically. Because do blasphemy affects me. Yeah, exactly. Hannah, I wonder maybe if you could talk a little about that, like domestically, what, what do you think have been the, the significant issues that Ireland has yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so unusually, obviously I'm step in, last minute step in for Lisa Chambers, so unusually I'm going to talk about domestic politics <laughs> rather than more European focus, but I will come back on a couple of things Shona said as well, because I think they're very interesting, um, and particularly the, the Victor Orban and, and the EPP thing. Um, obviously, you know, today is actually a very momentous day in a momentous year around repeal the 8th of the amendment, because Michael D. Higgins signed the legislation today, um, and, and that, is, that is a huge, yeah. huge deal. Um, it's a really significant change, and um, in a light-hearted way, and so much of that campaign was not really light-hearted at all, it was really difficult. Um, I was just thinking earlier on, at our Christmas party last year, a colleague said to me, like, well, you know, like, rate how bad it is for women in Ireland compared, like, you know, zero to, to the Taliban. <laughs> like, okay, well, that's really, you know, very difficult. What? <laughs> um, it's not an appropriate conversation. But anyway, um, you know, I was saying, well, it's, it's really, really bad because women in Ireland, you know, when they're pregnant, when they're engaging with maternal services, really serious things can happen and, you know, they, they don't have equal rights and it's, it's deeply problematic. And I think the shift in public perception and the shift in nuance around the debate of that the issues surrounding the referendum in the first half of this year, when you take a step back from those issues, is profound in what it says about Irish democracy. Um, and in a time where it's very current to talk about the systems, the governance being broken, I think actually the Citizens' Assembly and then the committee um, showed how well representative democracy can work. The path to the referendum um, was a really interesting example in how democracy can be far more responsive than when we think of it just solely as elections every five years. Um, now, that being said, I, I don't think we would have gotten to a referendum without a really active campaigning movement for decades, but particularly in the past five years that a lot of work was put in. Particularly, I think credit should be, a lot of credit should be given for you know, those who are in support of repealing the amendment to termination for medical reasons, a group of you know, um, families and, you know, and people who had suffered really, really atrocious individual stories and experiences talking about those publicly and lifting a veil of silence that really shifted what you might think of as a policy issue to very, very personal. Um, and if there was one slogan of the campaign that I think sums it all up was um, a very late slogan from Together for Yes. It's actually on an aside really interesting if you chart how they shifted their messaging throughout the campaign. I kept a leaflet from each week of the campaign for Together for Yes, and it was fascinating to see the ways in which they adapted and shifted to the changing, um, changing parameters of the debate. And actually, the last leaflets only featured doctors because they were getting internal polling showing that medical professionals were actually the only people who were being um, felt worthy of citizens' respect, which is another interesting element. Mm -hmm. But the last slogan that I'm referring to that they used was, um, someone you love might need your yes. And then they had T-shirts saying, "I might need your yes." And I thought that that was that you know, if there was ever a slogan that cut through policy to personal. I thought that that was that was really, really moving and powerful. So, so that's been a momentous change in Ireland this year, and um, one I'm very, very proud to have witnessed. And I think everyone who's involved in that campaign, you know, was, can really say they changed changed this country for the better. Um, there's myriad other domestic issues that haven't advanced at all this year. I think. Housing is one that everybody feels is, remains un, untra the untractable problem, with, along with health, perhaps. But even in health, with slanta care, we can see shifts happening in debate. Um, but, but housing is, is, is the, the issue that won't go away. Um, and I think that the headlines today around the, the numbers dropping in terms of construction in Dublin, and particularly of apartment blocks, that's particularly concerning. I think for 
the demographic sitting in this room tonight, you know, if you're living in Dublin and you want to stay living in Dublin, um, apartment building, that's, that's needed, high density building, that's needed. Um, and my own view would be that the state has a, has a clear role here that's, that, that it needs to, take, to step up and, and do more, uh, particularly the provision of affordable and social housing. Um, so I was going to pivot back to some kind of international elements and, and just uh, Shona's point on, on Victor Orban and, and the EPP. I, it was a real di disappointment for me that um, Fine Gael didn't engage in any debate about who they would support in the Spitzen candidate process, the lead candidate for commission president process, which was established for the first time in the last European elections, um, where all the European parliaments nominated candidates who, you know, seemingly the idea being that you vote for uh, Lynn Boylan for MEP in Dublin and the Sinn Féin supported European candidate if her, her European party, GUE NGL, do sufficiently well and win the European elections, their supported candidate will be president of the commission and so on and so forth. Um, in the last round, it was the, the EPP won the European elections, Juncker was the Spitzen candidate, he became commission president. That whole process is in great flux at the moment and it's not clear if there, it will ha be respected to the same extent because the European Council isn't so, so fond of the idea. Um, but the very, the e Fine Gael, as a member of the European People's Party, are supporting a candidate and they didn't debate it. They just decided to, they decided to support Manfred Weber, who I think is a very questionable yep. character. Um, he has, has never faltered in his support for Viktor Orban. Um, you know, and I, I think that that is, I think it's really a, a concern because, you know, you were talking about when you questioned Enda Kenny on it and when I was working in Brussels, you know, over, I started working in Brussels a decade ago, you know, uh, Hungarian MEPs were already deeply concerned about what was happening, you know, and that, that has been boiling and bubbling away for a long time and I think a real failing in contemporary politics is the idea that problems come out of nowhere. They don't, like they germinate, we see them develop. Yeah. This is exactly what happened in the Italian elections this mm -hmm. year. You know, it, Italy has had a really difficult time being at the front line of dialing, dealing with the migrant crisis. And now Italy has elected a government that is extremely disruptive within the European Council, but equally that has a full coalition partner who's, I would say, quite racist, that would be my own view. And, and that's um, the, the consequence of a lot of issues that have been bubbling away under the surface. Um, and the same thing applies to Hungary. And the fact that Manfred Weber is the EPP candidate now, you know, is, is questions how seriously the Article 7 proceedings are actually, exactly. are actually being taken. And with the Orban thing as well, I mean, uh, you know, because obviously, you know, member states are entitled to say, well, we don't require any interference from the European Union. But in actual fact, when it comes to Orban, a lot of, when he was setting up of these uh, new courts that deal with civil, uh, laws, the police oversight, and they're all Fidesz appointed judges. A lot of it was, you know, European taxpayers' money. Similarly, you know, he when he decided to get rid of the, me the media and set up his own, a lot of it's EU fund. A lot of it, what he does is EU funded. So, you know, the EU has a right to interfere in those. And I mean, we we'll let Ben talk. <laughs> but the one thing I would say on that is, you know, <laughs> uh, one thing around the Article Seven stuff that I found fascinating is, you know, to join the European Union, you have to meet the Copenhagen criteria. Um, of basic standards in democracy as, as, as well as other, and, but you don't have to maintain those during your membership. There's, there's, uh, that, that's a real open question for me now. I mean, if, if the European Union isn't a union of democracies, what is it? You know, there has to be some guiding core values there. They're stated in the treaties, but yet respect for them now is totally up in the air. Okay, and just as we're on the topic of dysfunctional democracies, um, America and um, Ben, uh, <laughs> you know, I, about, I think it was about a year and a half ago, you joined us at the YPN and we had a discussion about, about Trump and it was relatively early days in the administration, but we were, you know, talking about the possible uh, fractures between Europe and America, Korean foreign policy especially, the NATO relationship. Um, where do you see that now? Is there a steady state where things aren't getting much better, but they're not getting much worse? or? Where do you think we are in, the, in that relationship? Um, <clears throat> First of all, thanks for the invitation. Um, um, many, many years ago, I was a member of something called the Forward Perspectives Group, which was, which was this group, but much smaller, uh, about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and I just think to have you guys in a room like this is spectacular. And the only thing I'd say to you is, take control of this building. You need to take control of this building um, badly. They, they need you. 
Um, so anyway, as I say, thank you for thank you. There'll be nobody here for the next two weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> the time for the revolution is now. Um, yeah, and, and terms, you know, kicking off with Trump. I mean, I think for, for me, you know, bearing in mind it's Christmas, there there are four lumps of interrelated coal in my stocking. Um, the first is Trump. The second is global governance, which segues immediately into your question. Um, the third is authoritarianism in Europe, which you guys were talking about, and then the last one is migration. Um, starting with Trump, the, the the amazing thing about Trump, and, and speaking to people both in the State Department and here in the in the U.S. Embassy in, in Dublin, you know, the constant line you get is, you know, don't read the tweets, watch what we do. You know, there there is a deliberate attempt to to separate out what Trump does at three o'clock in the morning over his cold burgers in bed, um, and what the State Department and the Department of Defense does. What we're seeing is, is how destabilizing that disjunction can be for global governance. I mean, whether it's NATO, whether it's climate change, whether it's the madness with respect to Syria yesterday, you know, you see this huge gulf opening up between what he's trying to do and what the rest of the administration is trying to do. And a lot of the so-called adults who are in the room are leaving or have left. Um, and he is now bringing into himself you know, the hardcore lunatics uh, with respect to the US administration. And that, as I say, segues into a real crisis of global governance, because if the US is effectively out of commission, and I think it, has, it is in terms of global governance, the US is out of commission, who steps up? Who takes on that role? Um, and you see people you know, talking about China on climate, you see people talking about Europe on trade, you know, Europe, Japan, you know. But there is a real, real gap there, and, and there is an entire post-war liberal order which is under threat. Uh, at the global level, and I don't know where the leadership is coming from, and I don't have confidence that Europe has the capacity or the will to take on that leadership, and I don't want the Chinese to take on that leadership. So there's a real problem here, and I don't know that it will be solved if Trump goes and somebody else comes in. I, I think there's a, there are more profound issues there in terms of U.S. global leadership and who will provide that leadership going into the future. Um, that segues into my, my my concerns with respect to Europe, you know, taking on that role of global leadership because, and I. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm being I'm being too too provocative and, and over egging the pudding, but you know there's a rot has set in in Europe, a very serious rot. You know, Orban is just one. Mm -hmm. You know, Italy, Poland, Austria. You know, what's going on with Sweden? Are they in capacity? You know, the collapse of the Belgian government. You know, there, there's a theme here, people, with respect to attack on <clears throat> basic liberal democratic values. Um, and you know, you read the work of Yasha Monk, and you know, he makes this really interesting distinction between democracy and liberal democracy, and what liberal democracy, liberal in liberal democracy means. That's what we've got to hang on to, because if we lose that, then we're down the road of the authoritarian liberal democracies of the Orbans and the Salvinis and all the rest out there who are who are who are, who are contesting this. Which for me makes the European elections really pivotal and really really important. And I know. Everyone is giving Macron a hard time. You know, we're all very cynical about you know what what he hasn't yet done. You know, he hasn't saved the world in eighteen months. You know, that's an awful thing. He hasn't saved the world in eighteen months. Uh, and the Gilets jaunes, you know, we, we we've seen that crisis there. But you know, these elections could be very very important in terms of who gets into the European Parliament. And the real danger, to my mind, is you know, in in the parlance of political scientists, these are second order elections. You know, people don't vote, notwithstanding the spits and can of that process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's giving a kick to the government is what you use European parliamentary election for. If lots of people are of that mindset and lots of people want to give kicks to government, you could see a very nasty European parliament or a substantial minority of the European parliament coming precisely from the kinds of orientations we're talking about. So these elections, to my mind, are actually very important for the nature of the European Union itself, for its capacity to lead internationally on all these global governance issues. Um, and a lot of the insecurity that will give rise to that nasty minority, potential majority in the European Parliament, is deriving from the crisis around migration. Now, migration, you know, was not was the dog that didn't bite in 2018. You know, the numbers have gone down. The European Union has done awful things to ensure that the migration crisis is not in the headlines. You know, we have offloaded this problem onto Turkey. We have offloaded this problem onto Libya. We are doing things with Libyan coast guards and subterraneanly with Turkey, which, you know, on anyone's scale of ethical morality are an abomination, um, but they have managed it. And yet, nonetheless, you know, people in Europe, and most particularly people in Europe who don't have an experience of migration or migrants, are the most anxious and the most exercised, for whom migration is the highest salience issue. Um, we haven't tackled that. Um, and my final point, and this segues into the into the you know the, the, the Irish domestic, you know, let's not kid ourselves. 
that constituency is here. Mm. That constituency hasn't yet been mobilized, largely because we have a party called Sinn Féin, mm. which is, would be in any other political system the natural repository and home as an anti-establishment party, but it hasn't caught fire. We saw in the presidential elections, there is that constituency there. We haven't yet seen the, the, the light hit that touch paper, but don't kid yourself. It is possible, if not probable, that it could, it could happen here, which again comes down back to my primary point is there is a battle to be fought and a battle to be won, and we, not we, you, have had ferocious successes in constitutional referenda. There's a slight touch of smugness and self-satisfaction surrounding that at the moment. <laughs> Enjoy your victory. You deserve it. I promise you deserve it. For having lived in the previous regime, you deserve it. Um, but there's a big battle yet to be fought. And how do you see that battle manifesting? Is it going to be elections? Is it going to be... Down it's to parties, action? it's elections. It's the European parliamentary elections coming up now. You know, who, who, and not, not in an Irish context, it's not, going to be, it's not going to be a big issue, but at a pan-European level, I think this is really important. It, I mean, that's why they tried to get the budget done before the European parliamentary elections happened. They were trying to forestall the kind of problems they foresee with a very large... You know, if, these, if these people get their act together in the European Parliament, they could be a very large blocking minority within the European Parliament, you know, paralyzing the European Parliament's capacity to, to have deals on all the big ticket items, which is why they tried to sort out the budget beforehand, and they failed, and now we face what the European Parliament is going to, what is going to face. But there is, there is a big battle to be fought, both in the European parliamentary elections and going forward in terms of how we deal with Poland, how we deal with Hungary, how we deal with Italy, through the European Council, and whether the Commission has the actual backbone to use the treaty provisions that we have that are supposed to hold member states' feet to the fire in terms of human rights. And I don't have tremendous confidence. Mm. And sorry, from, from being on the ground in Brussels, do you, do you feel that sense of urgency at all among European politicians and, and maybe even bureaucrats? Or Not enough, is, you there, know, is there a bit of complacency? I have to say I was really disappointed in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote. And people like Eva Hofstadt, Elvar, Elvar Brock, you know, people who have been in and around European Parliament for so long, as well as the Junkers, and because they put it down to typical Eurosceptic Brits, and that this was an aberration, and not listening, and this is only, when was it, 2016, so we still had Orban, we still had problems in Poland, the, the, the Polish problems were starting to you know, evolve then, and there was clear, uh, and then 2016 was after 2015 with the migrant crisis, so it's very clear that this wasn't just, now I know that the British is very specific, but it was also, you know, uh, we knew that Marine Le Pen was doing well in France. And I was at a, an event, it was a, sort of an off-the-record thing with, uh, with those uh, MEPs. And they were so dismissive. And I would say, um, yeah, triumphalist in a kind of a, like, you know, the Brits are in trouble now. They voted to leave, but sure, look, at, that's what you get when you constantly condemn the European Union throughout your whole membership. Of course, people are going to vote to leave. And that's all true. <coughs> but um, never, which wouldn't take questions about well what are you going to do to make sure there is unity in the EU and actually surprisingly there is unity when it comes to Brexit but nobody expected that but that doesn't mean the other issues aren't major fault lines once the Brexit issue goes away and so no I don't think enough has been done and um, I think there is a sort of willing blindness and now Juncker and Tusk are moving out away so that they, you know they don't probably have the will necessarily to do it and then as Ben was saying you know um there's so many co uh, countries that you have to deal with. How uh, are you going to sanction all of them? Mm. You, you know, you can't even get a, a, a pact when it comes to the, how to deal with migration. There's no agreement on you know the, the Dublin regulation. There's no agreement on anything. And so, uh, is the EU going to sanction you know Poland, Austria, you know, or or like uh, well, I know Austria is not necessarily like anti-democratic, but in terms of their position on migration, the fact that they're fueling the this idea, this problem, this problem, this idea that migration is a huge issue that's going to overburden the European Union. Like nobody's doing anything to, to say, uh, look, you know, this is manageable, this is, we're, we're a huge block, and, you know, these people aren't actually coming to you know, kill us, and we can absorb it in the best way if we do it in a, in a way that's united and sensible. Instead, I feel like a lot of politicians, and Mark Rutte did the same thing in the Dutch elections, actually um, met the extremist parties rather than defy them you know they, when they, they thought Gerd Wilders party were going to do well he kind of ramped up the, the anti-immigration rhetoric rather than saying you know this is um, 
hyperactive uh, mentality and we shouldn't be racist. Like Nicola Sturgeon has been great. I think uh, we, we are, there was, she had talked about how migration is so important in actual fact in Scotland. And, and in fairness, Leo Varadkar has had that position too. You know, he does say it's important. But um, yeah, no, I don't think uh, that the effort, the willingness isn't there, even though, and, the, and, and, and I think it's, they've come late to the game in recognising um, there is a lot of mixed messaging that goes along with migration in general, though, because in, you know, in one sense, in the Brexit negotiations, the EU is saying, well, you can't have the benefits, i.e. single market, without the cost, i.e. free movement. And that's that automatically cost? framing it yeah. as if yeah. that's a cost. You know? And it's, it's, it's difficult then for them to turn around and say to their other partners, oh, but you should be welcoming of migrants unconditionally. So it is a kind of a mixed... There's a, there's a socioeconomic yeah, element to that absolutely. as well, though. When we talk about freedom of movement, we're often talking about freedom of movement as an asset for those who are educated and privileged enough to be able to move. And, or if you and benefit. need, you know, fruit pickers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, one way or the other. Yeah. Um, not talking necessarily about the people in, in the middle who might feel squeezed out from employment opportunities um, at home because of freedom of movement. And I do think that, you know, like there's been more discussion of social policy and there was the EU Social Summit last year in Gothenburg and, and the ways in which the EU can temper the excesses of globalisation um, and, and, and meet people's concerns in some way. And there, I think, are some simple enough mechanisms as well. You know, we talk all the time about Erasmus being the great success story um, of, of the European Union for young people. But that's if you go to university. Yes. The extension of Erasmus Plus for people in apprenticeships and vocational training, I think, is, would be a, a huge benefit because you should be able to have the opportunity to live and learn anywhere in the European <coughs> Union and be supported in doing that no matter what your chosen educational route is. Um, so, so things like that, I think, would go quite a bit away of at least showing a willingness to engage with um, not just the, the same old group as, as foreseen as essentially elitist. Um, because that is, I think, you know, the EU's biggest communication challenge is being seen as you know, distant and elitist and of benefit only to those within a certain social grouping. Mm -hmm. Just one more question for the panel before we open up to the floor. You know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about you know, spinning this kind of, you know, whether it's post-truth or fake news here or however you want to frame it. But I do wonder sometimes, do you think we actually focus a little bit too much on economics? And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you make the point it's not a cost. And, you know, all economists tell us that free trade and, um, you know, immigration are good for economies and they, they have an economic benefit. There are some losers, but the winners, you know, all those kind of mm. arguments. But a lot of people just don't care about that. And they say, I'll take the hit. It's a cultural thing for me. Um, and that seemed to be what happened in Brexit. They'll mm -hmm. say, sure, we'll be less well off, but you know, we'll be, be British. And there, there's a lot that you can frame it as racism, you can frame it as you know, ethnocentrism, however. But do you think that that's maybe a new approach that we need to take in this thing, that we're actually talking too much about economics? And the same thing with the United Ireland discussions going around now. People are saying, but there'll be a hit. And Schiffer is saying, we don't care if there's a hit. This is about, we're, we don't care if the economy will shrink. It's more important that we have a united Ireland. So I mean, this, is a huge, this is a huge debate, I mean, in, in social sciences generally. I mean, you know, our traditional model for social sciences is the rational actor model. You know, everybody sits down and does this careful cost-benefit analysis, and we make all these decisions. And, you know, there's experimentation, there's theory, all of it backing this up, the rational actor model. But people have hearts. People have emotions. <laughs> People can be irrational. We, we know that we are irrational. We know that we do things that are not you know, a cost-benefit analysis. I got totally stung in the shopping center down the road here the other day. Um, you know, I ended up buying these two nail repair kits from this woman who's just a really good salesman person. Um, I had total cost, no benefit to me at all. I uh, spent 60 euro. I'm disgusted with myself. But what I'm saying is, thank you. I, she did that one nail. One nail she did. Um, but no, what I'm saying is, you know, we, we in the social sciences and, and more broadly, we do have to take emotion and identity more seriously. And for me, the, the trick is, and particularly facing the kind of issues we're taking, facing in terms of migration, it's not about telling people that migration improves the economy and adds more to taxation and increases our skill set. It's saying we like the society that comes mm. with migration. We like the diversity. We like the heterogeneity. We like people of different colors with different music and different everything. And you know that is a strength and a benefit. And you can be true to yourself and welcoming at the same time. And there's no mm. offsetting costs to that. Yeah. Mm. But you don't see political leaders making that argument. Because what you see is, as you're saying, Shona, they tack to the extremes. Mm. 
particularly the conservative parties, will tack to the extreme right parties because, oh, people are worried about migration, therefore we must meet their agenda. You're playing on their football pitch when you do that. You're, fate, you're, you're, you're seeding the game immediately if you play on that pitch. And you're also accepting that they're right, and then therefore Absolutely. you just confirm that there is something to be fearful of. So Absolutely. therefore your reaction means that, okay, well, okay, so there's something you're scared of, now you're behaving. You're only arguing about means then. Yeah. The only argument then is about yeah. means. Yeah. Harder means or softer yeah. means. Yeah. I think within the, the fake news, just the dominance of that narrative around how do we deal with how society at the moment, one of the things that I was thinking about recently to do with this is, you know, a lot of the rise of fake news, I think the solutions potentially lie within um, education and not education in the sense of, you know, how does education respond to technological change and how do our education systems respond to technological change? And not that we all need to learn coding in, you know, in primary school, but actually more that um, understanding how to critically an analyze news and sources and where information comes from and bias. Um, it, that needs to be mainstreamed across our societies throughout all our education system in a way that everybody has access to that kind of information that again might be the, you know, the privilege of those who get to go on to higher education in a very detailed way because with the multiplicity of sources of news and less gatekeepers people are bombarded by news from all, all sources and don't necessarily have the same time to reflect on well who is this coming from and equally with the rise of the trust of a person like me rather than the trust in representatives <coughs> of institutions, be they religious, political, um, or state. If, if we trust our peers more, then we have to understand where our peers are sourcing things they're sharing that we're taking as given and writ. And developing those skills within um, all citizens, I think, is, is a prerequisite now for shoring up democracy and liberal democracy, because without it, how, how, how do you be a responsible and citizen? And one concrete thing everybody in this room could do tomorrow is put your money in your pocket and pay for a news source tomorrow. Yeah. Buy a newspaper, subscribe to a newspaper, subscribe to something. New York Times, Washington Post, Irish, whatever it is, but subscribe to it and pay for journalism that is quality journalism. Because if you don't, we will all end up reading BuzzFeed forever. <laughs> Just on your point about um, you know, education, <coughs> I guess teaching people from a young age how to deal with the internet. Somebody did point out to me recently, a colleague, that what happens now when kids are Googling is Santa real. So you want to teach them, you know, <laughs> but don't, not everything has to be exactly as you really know. It's kind of a sad outcome. Um,